I've had such a trippy life. <laughs> Were you able to sing like right out of the gate? No, I could not sing in the beginning. Mm. Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hours, right? Exactly. And I really got to experience that growing up around my dad's band. I've seen the depths and the bowels of fame. No famous person is any better than anyone else or any different from you and I. It's all smoke and mirrors. <laughs> You're listening to Studio 22. Welcome to Studio 22. I'm your host, Will Meldman, here, as always, with Brock O'Hearn. Good morning, people. Feeling good? Feeling great. We have an incredible guest today. We are here with actress Lucy Walsh, author of Remember Me as Human and daughter of rock and roll legend Joe Walsh. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to meet you both. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, you're welcome. I feel like yeah. we missed a couple of accolades, though. I mean, you've got singer, songwriter, uh, you've scored film. Yeah, I did Obviously, that. author. Are you working on a screenplay as well? Uh, yeah. It sounds like I never <laughs> wanted... Uh, do, do you know what I mean about, like, being a jack of all trades is kind of, like, silly? Yeah. Like, you're kind of... People don't take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So when people... I've been doing some interviews and people are listing off things I've done. And I'm like, oh my God, I sound like I'm dabbling in so many different things, but it's really very basic. It's acting, music, and writing. Yeah. I yeah. always knew I wanted to be an actor. I always loved performing and I obviously grew up in a musical family and I, and I hoped to write a book someday. And that's really what I've spent my life doing and it's taken me some crazy places. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's all like a form of creation and expression, right? Yeah. Like in that category. Yeah. The performing arts is yeah. just where my heart's always been. What about, are you two musicians? I wish. I, I wish. I, I was when I was younger. Yeah. And then I kind of fell out of it because just I moved somewhere. I, would play, I played drums and I sang and I moved around all the time. Never lived in the same place for more than a year. So I would right. move and lose pieces of the set. And I couldn't afford to buy more. Oh my God, you couldn't replace, you were down to like yeah. one, was, yeah, <laughs> one, like one drum. One hi-hat. I'm like, oh, this is not working out for me. Um, and then same thing with my voice. When I hit puberty, it, oh, I couldn't sing after that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I also, my, I, was, I wanted to ask you this, because you, were you able to sing like right out of the gate or, and then obviously you work at it as a singer, but, or did you, did you have to work at it from? That's a really great like, question. Before yeah. I answer it, are, are you a musician? I pretty similar story. I, yeah. I took guitar and drums and sang in a band and you lost all your instruments and gave up when you hit puberty. <laughs> yeah. Definitely Same gave story. up after puberty. It was kind of like fourth to sixth or seventh grade. We do yeah. like bar mitzvahs and talent shows and stuff wow. like that. He got farther than you did. Way farther. Yeah, well, he did some yeah. performing. A little bit, if you could call <laughs> it that. Um, but just always been a huge music fan. Yeah. Um I went to a lot of shows with my mom at Shoreline Amphitheater and you know, just loved rock and roll and, and, um, you know, a little bit of hip hop, but just music's been a huge part of both our lives. Yeah, for sure. It's a huge part of everyone's life, I think. Yeah. Um, to answer your question, that's a great question. No, I could not sing in the beginning. Mm. I, I, um, I grew up singing gospel, like three part harmonies with my grandmother, Wanda, who my book is about, but, I didn't have any training to speak of until I was 19. Mm. And when, when I hit 19, my dad made it possible for me to study with a private music coach every day who was this master from Juilliard. His name is Joel Ewing. And um, he coaches all the rock stars, all the opera singers. And I only, I, I could barely sing Mary Had a Little Lamb, to be honest. I had no voice to speak of. And he built my voice from oh. the ground up. And I was oh. with him five days a week every morning at nine o'clock for about 10 years. Wow. And my father made that possible. So I have about a half a million dollar music education in my brain. That's and um, and it's given me quite a life as, as a musician that's gone on to do many different aspects of the craft. But no, yeah. I had no voice in the beginning. That's amazing. I did love it though, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest things. You gotta love it, right? The passion for it. It's, I've seen so many people that, don't know or don't have a you know an in with it right even if it's right. not like you don't have friends that play instruments family or anything like that but there's something about music in some form that pulls to them yeah i had that in high school with a friend and she was like when she started couldn't 
like tone deaf. Yeah. But put, yeah. Put, put, invest in herself. And by the end of the, you know, four or five years with vocal coaches, she was amazing. You're right. It is an investment in yourself. Yeah. I have my own um, performing arts studio now, the Lucy Walsh Performing Arts Studio that wow. I created a few years ago. And, uh, and I coach all kinds of singers. And I know because it happened to me that you can build the craft from the ground up. They say you can't teach certain things. You know, they say like, you can't teach timing in comedy. You can't teach someone to have a voice, but there are ways to yeah. build these things within yourself. And yeah, yeah it's pretty exciting to I get think, to see singers grow like that. Cause I've taken many people from being tone deaf to having a gorgeous voice and yeah. being able to go out into the professional arena. I love hearing that. I think that's a really inspiring message for people to hear out there. I do too. It's yeah. important that people know that because then there's hope. Yeah. Definitely. And, and like you said, Brock, if the love is there, that yeah. goes a long way. That is your way in. That's where to begin. Yeah. hundred percent. And you can, you can craft everything else. That's why it's called a craft because it's been crafted. Yep. It's a good it's, point. It's yeah. like, uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours, right? Exactly. It's, it's, you can have talent and God-given talent, but it's only going to get you so far That's when it right. comes to the people who have work ethic. That's right. Will eventually outwork the talent. Absolutely. Yeah. And I really got to experience that growing up around my dad's band mm. because I saw those guys go out on stage and make it look so easy. And I also saw the hundreds of hours that they put into making it look effortless. And I'm so grateful I got to witness that work ethic because it's I've applied it to my own life. Yeah. And uh, it's very important. It doesn't happen by accident, man. Anyone can book a job. Yeah. Anyone can book a couple jobs. You can be the hot thing for a second, but you can't have a long a long term career. Yeah. You can't make a lifetime of it. That's such good advice to give people too, because I've seen that in careers as well. And it's some advice I got from a friend: is it's hard to get to the top, and it's even harder to stay there. Yeah, and it it's, is. It's that. It's how hard are you willing to work? What are you willing to do to to earn that place? Because you can get there. You can get that shot. You can get lucky. Yeah. You can catch a break, or you did work to get to where you're at. But if you're not going to continually keep at it, then yeah, and that just comes from the love of it, wouldn't you say? Yeah, hundred percent. Like you can't sustain something long term unless there's a true love of it. Yeah, yeah it, it'll eventually way. weed itself out. Right? Yeah, like hundred percent. And I, I apologize for in the title. It's hard to list everything out. So, you know, <laughs> but we're making up for it by talking about it. But. No, that's what I mean. Like, I, I am first and foremost an actress. That's what I yeah. love the most, if I had to say. So I love your title. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. How you introduced yeah, me? Intro, yeah. yeah. No, that's, I'm very proud to be an actor. That's amazing. <laughs> where, where did that love for acting come from? Or when did it first show up in your life? The first time I remember having that epiphany or that recognition was, it must have been about five. And I would just watch Gone with the Wind over and mm -hmm. over and over. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Uh, it's like a very heavy movie for a five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. But I saw Vivian Lee on that screen and I just honestly like pointed and was like, Mm. Oh my God, that's, I just had this total recognition and I've heard other actors talk about it. I heard uh, Mark Ruffalo say recently that he had that with Brando at about the same age and yeah. you don't really know what it is, but you're just like, um, oh, that's it. That's me. And um, I was never wanted to do anything else. Yeah. That was it. I kind of made up my mind at five, even yeah. though my mom wouldn't let me do it until I was an adult because she wanted me to have as normal a childhood as possible. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty cool because, yeah, I've, you see it in a lot of times with child actors that really can get pretty heavy. You can put a toll on them, you know? Yeah, it's uh, definitely, exposure um, so young. You wouldn't wish it on your child unless they were, yeah. well, I guess some people would. There's a lot yeah, of stage true. parents, huh? Yeah. And <laughs> it's also, yeah. too, like what other kids like work like that, right? So it's also just the concept of having a job that young, I guess, yeah. right? And like- it's an interesting, but it's, yeah. it's also one of those things where you, to have that, I, I think it's a gift to know what you want to do that early on. You know, there's people in their thirties, forties, fifties that still don't really know. I what know. They want, so you know? many of my yeah. friends went through that where they got out of high school or college and they just kind of flailed and floated yeah. and, and still, I mean, it never ends. It never yeah. ends because we have so many different chapters to our lives. Yeah. And, and I believe that our lives really move in seasons and when those chapters close, it's okay. It doesn't mean you failed. Yeah. You're on to a new chapter. You're not in that season anymore. And for a long time, I thought that like, 
life was meant like success was meant like an accumulation of something to like a huge degree of it. Mm. But now I don't, I don't think of life like that. I think, I think it's okay to move through to different things that you're curious about. Like what I was curious about five, 10 years ago is not what I'm curious about pursuing today yeah. or next year. And like not to be down on ourselves because we feel like we failed at something because we didn't see it through for the next yeah. 20 years. It's okay. Yeah. But truthfully, it's exactly what you said. Life, it's ebbs and flows of life, right? And, and I you think go through so. seasons. And that thing might have led you to what is really bringing you joy and happiness and fulfillment and success, the real form of success Absolutely. that you're looking for. And it may be, it's, I mean, look at how many people go to college, right? And then yeah. they think they want to be a doctor or this yeah. or that. You know, they realize, oh, I really want to be a musician or I really want to, you know, start a career doing something else completely different. But that path leads you there and you, you need that. Absolutely. I don't think anything is wasted. Yeah. I think it's just a beautiful journey. Yeah. That's what I think. Definitely <laughs> agree with that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of a beautiful journey, um, it was a huge treat to be able to, you know, go through this early. I know it's not out yet, no, but it's you, not. You got exclusive copies and extremely grateful for that. And honestly, like, I mean, there are some things in here that, you know, I really did get emotional reading it. And, um, you know, it definitely was a huge treat. What inspired you to start this project? So when I was 17, my grandmother, Wanda, thank you. <laughs> it looks so, it's so surreal to see you holding that. It's amazing. Um, when I was 17, my grandmother, Wanda, gave me 63 of the love letters that my grandfather, Dale, had written to her during World War II. And they had written hundreds back and forth, but only these 63 remain. He had to burn all of her letters that she sent him. Mm. And he talks about it in one letter, how devastating that was. A lot of, uh, most men had to burn all the letters because they couldn't carry them. They were right on the front lines and they were moving a lot. Um, so I only have my grandfather's side of, of the letters. So when I got them at 17, I knew that they were a really big deal. And I knew that I wanted to turn them into a film someday but I didn't know how to do that. The only thing I did know was that I wanted to get Ron Howard to I do love that it. Part, yeah. And so, like I say in the book, I literally, I really did. I carried the letters in my purse for like years in case oh. I ran into him at the store or something. And I would like <laughs> pitch him my, so my film. But even though I didn't know how to go about making the film yet, I knew that what I needed to do was start to ask questions of my grandparents and fill in the story, find my story around these letters. And in the midst of those thoughts developing, my grandfather Dale died with Alzheimer's before I got a chance to speak with him. And that really scared me and shocked me because I saw his memories and his thoughts stolen, like taken before his body even died. And I think my trauma response to that I know, I know my trauma response to that was to like go into overdrive asking questions. And in a way I started to like try to collect all my loved ones' memories because I didn't know where Alzheimer's would strike next. Mm. And I thought like, okay, if I can just gather everyone's memories and document everything, then Alzheimer's can never win again. Mm. And I think that's a big part of why I, why it was so important to me to write my grandparents' story surrounding these letters was to make sure that Alzheimer's didn't win again and that they get to live forever. And so that led me ultimately to interviewing my grandmother in her nursing home for three days when she was 97. And I, and I taped the whole thing and she died four months later. So this book, Remember Me as Human, is the story of those three final days that I spent with her in her nursing home. And what started as asking questions about the letters really became a masterclass in what it means to be human and how to truly live and embrace that and celebrate that. And that's a very important message that I stand for sharing with others especially at a time like this when AI and technology are stealing our humanity mm. and our connection of sitting here and staring into each other's eyes. 
I think it's more important than ever. It's a timeless story that must be told at a time like this. Such a strange juxtaposition. Yeah. I feel like there's so much uh, self-identity and self-knowledge like, of finding yourself in, in that exactly what you're saying right there that's so important for people because I think when you know yourself you're the world opens up to you in a different way you know what I mean and yeah and to take that like I I had an experience with a neighbor of mine so I lost my my grandfather before I was born and then three days later my mom found out she, she was uh, pregnant with oh me oh my god! I never got to know him it was her father it was her father Whoa. yeah so I didn't grow up with grandfathers but I and I still have my grandmothers but something happened before about three, four years ago, um, I had a neighbor who, when I first moved to this new house in this neighborhood, uh, we didn't like each other. I was gone filming for about a month, so I hadn't even moved in a single piece of furniture when I got the house. And he uh, parked in my driveway. And I'm oh, like, who the heck? I, after a month, I came back. I'm like, who the heck is in my driveway? Is he like, your age? Me? No, no. He was in his 70s. Oh. Well, what happened is we didn't like each other for the first like six months. And then we sat down and actually talked. The guy was awesome. You know, he showed yeah. me his knife collection. We talked about life. He showed me, you know, his places up in Tahoe and how much he loved nature and all this stuff. And he like became like a grandfather figure to me. Wow. And I remember towards the end of uh, the four years of me living there, he got really sick. And I loved this guy, uh, Larry. I loved this guy. Yeah. And I remember I saw him age 20 years in like three weeks. Wow. He, he was diagnosed with uh, two different forms of terminal cancer. Um, and completely just changed everything. And I remember, I wish I, I had written down or gotten a book and asked him all these questions about yeah. life. And it was at that point, it was too late. He was too sick. He was too tired. He had no energy left, you know? And, um, I think about that with my family a lot too. Like, you know, you got to interview your grandma at 97 years old, I know, which is an incredible long life. Um, the things that she has seen, experienced. Oh my God, I know. You. It's I can't extraordinary. Even, yeah. I'm really happy you shared that story. That's exactly my wish for what people are inspired by with this book. And I'm hearing the same thing as what you just said from everyone who's read it, men and women, they have to share their own story of where they felt the most connected with another and where they wish that they had asked more questions. Not that you weren't curious about this man. I know you loved him yeah. very much, but we can always look back and have regrets about how much we didn't ask of someone. Yeah. We take each other for granted because we yeah. think we have all the time in the world, but when we're gone, we're gone. Yeah. All those stories, all those memories, an entire world that exists in another person is gone. And that's okay. Obviously that's the point of life and death, yeah. you know, birth and death and all that, but to celebrate each other while we're here, instead of just taking each other for granted, and putting each other in boxes and just going, oh, I know, I know who my mom is. Oh, yeah, that's just my mom. No, yeah. no, 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 no. There's an entire world in that person. And I think that, again, AI and technology is robbing us of our curiosity. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Do you think that we're headed in a good direction, you know, with, with like, because uh, it's isolating, it all is. of that. It is, and I mean, I think the notion of, not letting Alzheimer's win is beautiful and making sure to preserve and record that yeah. is something that now you can pass down and it, for generations and that's generations right. and it can last. And I think that's a beautiful notion. And, you know, one of my favorite parts of that is when, you know, you go to the piano in the nursing home and yeah. you talk about the importance of music. And, yeah. and by the way, I'm not sh sure if I'm supposed to be sharing like spoilers or anything. Of course you can, but, yeah. Um, but that moment was so beautiful because it kind of tied into the rest of your life as well with music playing right. such a big role and, you know, seeing the impact of that. What was that moment like? And can you kind of expand on that? The moment of playing piano in the nursing home? Yeah. 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 So every, so I grew up going to this nursing home and it really does, it's like another character in the book. Uh, it's the setting where, where a lot of the book takes place. And it was always very upsetting for me to be in that place. And every time I would go, my grandmother would make me sit at the piano and play for everyone. And it was really, and I do describe it in the book, it was very scary. I think that we are very afraid by old age. Mm. We're very afraid of old people when we see them sitting in a corner drooling. I don't think people know what to do with that. Yeah. 
Mm. It's very overwhelming. And um, I'm going to talk in a bit about an association that I've joined with to bring more awareness to that. But that experience at the piano in the nursing home changed my life, the one that I write about, where I saw people who were sitting there with their head in their lap, lift their head up and start to move to the music and come back. They came back. Mm. And I saw the power, not just of music, that happens to be something I bring to the table because I'm a musician, but whatever it is, Mm. just sitting with someone, looking at them in the eye, treating them like a human being, reminding them that they are human. It makes me very emotional because you forget as you get older that you're still human. And people treat you differently because they're afraid of what's happening. And it's this very ignored area of society, I think, where people just don't want to fucking look at it. Yeah. But guess what? It's going to happen to all of us. And it's okay. And what I learned in that moment of playing music for them and seeing them have that reaction and that peace in the moment and, and some healing, even if it only lasted for 30 minutes, was that it's very easy to change someone's life for the better. I think people get overwhelmed by thinking, oh, who am I to make a difference in the world? But let me ask you, if it were you in that nursing home and someone came in and played a song that you recognized from your childhood and it made you go, Mm. oh my God, yeah, oh my God, would that make a difference in your life? Absolutely. So we can make a difference in people's lives one at a time. That's all it takes. And that's enough. You don't have to go out there and change the world. You can walk into a nursing home and say, hi, I'd like to sit with someone and play cards. Hi, I'd like to read a book with someone for a half hour. That's enough. And that's what it taught me was like, because I'm the adult child of an alcoholic. So I struggle with like trying to save everybody. You know, I'm sure you can relate, but you don't have to save everybody. We can't. You can't. All you can do is bring somebody a smile and, and, and a moment of peace. Yeah. So that's what that taught me, kind of a roundabout answer to like, I'm really grateful that she pushed me to do that because I would say, no, no, I don't want to, oh, no. Mm. But it's not as scary as you think to yeah. just connect with another person and, and give them a little happiness for a second. And it's, and it's beautiful. I think it's incredible you got that perspective, you know? And I, yeah. I think that people forget, like when we're young, we are surrounded by so many other kids our age, you know, you go through school, you're in high school, yeah. middle school, elementary, all that. You go through that and then college so for a lot of people. But as you get older, it gets more and more lonely. Yeah. You know, you lose. And more and more for, scary. Exactly. Because you know you're getting closer Aging to. Aging is scary, man. Yeah. I have so much respect for my elders because it takes courage yeah. to embrace aging. Mm. Yeah. It really does. And I heard a great thing that kind of keeps it in perspective for me. I'm going to misquote it, but it was like, old age isn't them. It's happening to them. Yeah. Wow. Because we get like annoyed with an older person or like disgusted or scared or whatever. And you're like, oh, I don't want that near me. But they don't want it either. Right. It's happening to them. Yeah. They're 20 years old in their brain. Exactly. I just have so much respect for aging. Yeah. I can't. I mean, we're young, yeah. we're young, yeah. but we're much older than we were. <laughs> and the, the older I grow, I just see every day I wake up, I go, oh fuck, life is not what I thought at all. Yeah. I'm gonna have to reevaluate what I thought this journey is because every single day the shadows are shifting and new things are coming into my consciousness that I never considered before. It's quite extraordinary. It's awesome in the true sense of the word. Yeah. Life is, fuck. I, like <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm, I, you know what? I'm, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's great too, uh, real quickly before you go, um, in Western cultures yeah. to have these reminders too, because a, a lot of Eastern cultures, you know, treat their elders with a little bit more respect. They and do, and tradition. they're much and, more at peace with the aging process, but yeah. not us, and especially <laughs> not in this town. Well, that's yeah. why <laughs> these, you know, books like this and stories like this are so important, I think, for us in the West. I, I, I truly believe that. Yeah. I think so too. I think there, there's, when you realize how precious life is, it gives you a different perspective of like, aging is scary. You know, we don't know how much time we really have here, have no. here, but at the same time, it's, 
I've shifted over the years, um, past couple of years specifically of just having this extreme gratitude for today. I know. Because it's at the end of the day, like all we have is today. We won. We woke up today. Yeah. We yeah. made it. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a successful life. You want to know what success is? <laughs> yeah. You woke up today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, what, and what do you do with that day? And if you're lucky, yeah. you get to do something you love yep. in amidst 100%. all the other stuff you have to do to keep your life on track. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, and I, and I love what you said about, you know, not being able to uh, realizing you want to save everyone, but not being able to do that. Right. Like, do you know what I, I oh, yeah. do? You feel that in your own lives? Do yeah, you struggle yeah, yeah. with that? Yeah. Well, that's I, I had to get to the point where you realize you you have to. I had to start realizing that I can only help people to a certain point. Yeah. And in that point for me is to the point that when it starts to hurt me. If it starts to affect me or hurt me negatively, that's when I pull back because before I just keep going. And then they I would know. drain me, take from me, whatever it is. And then I'm left with nothing. And well, then I can't help anybody That's at that right. point. And one thing on the topic of what you just said for me that resonates is I saw this quote a long time ago and it just sat with me, you know, and it's, if you want to change the world, you have to first change yourself. Yeah. Because I wanted to save the world. I wanted to help everyone that's ever been hurting, you know, and you, you talk about doing these small things for people. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that you're saving everyone. No. It doesn't need to, you have to save somebody's whole world. It's. I've had moments in my life where a single smile or a single conversation saved it. I know. And yeah. then realizing that power that you don't know what someone else is going through. You don't know what someone's dealing with. You don't know what they're struggling with. If you can do one kind act for them, it could be as simple as opening a door for Absolutely. somebody. Absolutely. Don't around. underestimate the power of yeah. a small act. I, I, you know, a friend come to me asking for like a small loan, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, he has kids and I don't. Right. Yeah. And he's going to pay me back. You know, I've known him forever. It's not a big deal, but it's like, there was no part of me that was going to say no to that. Right. It's like, that's beautiful. It's like, you know, it's one of those small things that you just, you realize you're not the only person in the world and, and yeah. like one small thing can, can help someone else. And it's just, yeah. If you can help then you must 100% you know? and 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 like Brock is saying like you arrive at a boundary where you're like this I can't do this and it's I think listening to yourself that's what my journey through people pleasing has been mm -hmm. is like yeah of course my you know a friend at, yes yes you know yeah. here take, I, of course but then you you got to listen to yourself when it's like no actually I can't do that right you know and that's okay and it doesn't mean you're yeah selfish or terrible person or anything it's just i think knowing ourselves in terms of boundaries um and what's good for us is like the key to authentic relationships right because if you're helping someone while being detrimental to yourself then it's that's you not know, really it's help is it yeah yeah because you got to come first in a way right we always have to put ourselves first like you said it has to begin with the self for sure yeah. if you're if your cup isn't full how can you fill anyone yeah. else's yeah 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 yeah. With LA too, how important is, uh, I mean, growing up in LA and then I know you've lived in LA a lot of your life, right? Yeah, we're all kind of LA kids here. Yeah. Um, how, how much do you value authenticity in a person? Oh my God. Well, I've had such a trippy life. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh my God. Growing up uh, in a famous family the way I did with not just my dad, but my uncle i mean because beatles fans are a whole different level of interesting <laughs> um i think it gave me the perfect learning ground to be able to turn around and write about what it means to be human mm. because i've seen the depths and the bowels of fame and i've seen that everybody's the exact same. No famous person is any better than anyone else or any different from you and I. It's all smoke and mirrors. And I mean that in a good way. I don't mean that as like angry at anything about fame. I, I, um, I've had a wonderful life with it all. I, I, <laughs> it's not been easy, but I do value authenticity now in my life above anything else. Mm. Um, for a long time, I wasn't even aware of what it meant to have authentic relationships because like I was saying before we started recording, I I had a lifetime of like walking into rooms and people already knowing who I was. And 
I wasn't aware of that because I was just being me existing in my life. And you're not aware of other people feeling that way, but it made me very susceptible to predators. Mm. And, um, and I'm able to spot that much better now. Like I can really feel it immediately if somebody is overly, um, uh, you know, like close with you too soon or, or if, if you want to be your best friend right away. It's strange. Yeah. You can, you can start to spot it. So, I I used to not be able to see it and 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 I've really changed my life around. I've really um allowed a lot of relationships to leave my life <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> gently, you know, and <laughs> yeah. move along and I've really tightened up uh the circles of those I trust. Yeah. Um for my own safety as well. I had a very serious stalker situation oh, that no. I still have a restraining order um on. So I take personal safety and very seriously, not yeah. for just myself, but my loved ones and my friends. I take that shit so seriously, yeah. man. Don't yeah. you tag me in a picture somewhere that I'm at. Don't you, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm very serious about privacy. And, uh, and you should be, it's your safety. It's your, yeah. Yeah. Your and well-being. also I work with kids through my performing arts studio. And now more than ever, I've got to protect those kids. Yeah. yeah. Like I don't tag people. I don't post anything without asking. You got to be very, very careful for you too as well. Be careful boys yeah, because sure. we're public figures and people are strange. Yeah. And in this day of technology, we have more access to each other than ever. Yeah. yeah. And people feel like they know you. Oh yeah. And it's not just celebrities, and but it's normal people. I mean, people are weird everywhere. You just have to keep your wits about you and never yeah. assume that no one's paying attention. Yeah. Because they are. There's always somebody paying attention. <laughs> so you definitely were able to kind of spot who's authentic and who's not. I mean, I'm not saying that, I'm like, like an expert, yeah. you know, but um I can I can what but, I what I what I can do now is trust my instincts. Right. Whereas before I wasn't even in touch with my instincts to even <laughs> know not, what they were telling me. Right. It's not something that you just know right off the bat, right? You, no. It's just an exposure thing. It's like you it's not a normal thing to need to feel aware of everyone's authenticity. No, it's just like is. trusting and, and, and spot and like yeah. listening to red flags when yeah. they come up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're yeah. so, we've so trained ourselves to ignore red flags in life. We just have, all yeah, of us yeah. have, we're idiots when it comes to picking up on red flags, but like, you gotta, you gotta protect yourself. Yeah. And I, and I went through, I've gone through the many different phases of life and, and friendship is something that I value very, very much now. And, I've told this to many of many of my friends. Like, I don't care. Truly, I, I don't care what you do in life, how much money you make, what your status is. And it's like, if you're not a good person, yeah, I don't have space or time for you in my life. And it's just the way it is. Because at the end of the day, my quality of life goes down if I have to deal with some billionaire that says he's my friend that's, that's trying to take right. advantage. It's like, there's no point of that. That's you know? what it is. It's the quality of life and it's the amount of energy and time that you spend because yeah. when, as yeah. you grow older, your time and energy becomes yeah. the most precious thing you've got. And if this person is going to be a, you know, waste my time and energy yep. and cause me to be upset for a year, then no thanks. I'll spot it. the red flags early. Yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the best lessons I ever learned was you have to teach people how to treat you. Yeah. It's when you do that, they're going to do what one of two things, you know, yeah. it's they're either going to treat you the way you deserve to be treated, the way you know, and where your boundaries are at, yeah. uh, or they're not. And now it's up to you. What are you going to do at that point? You either get rid of them completely, keep them at arm, arm's length, yeah. but then you create this ecosystem for yourself of a healthy life, That's you know, right. a more enjoyable life. And, and it doesn't mean you have to have a fight with people. You don't, you, know, you don't even have to say anything. It's just a knowingness inside of you and a decision. Yeah. Okay. I don't need to invest any more of my energy there. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I'm going to yeah. take it elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big part of what I've done kind of, you know, growing up is I eliminated a lot of my kind of social life, honestly, to spend more time on work and family. Yeah. Right. Cause I just kind of like, I, I may have had too much social life imbalance, you right. know, in my twenties, but essentially it's reel that in. Right. And now yeah. I'm pretty much all, you know, work and family. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Gotta be careful. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, though. That's true. <laughs> but you're totally right. And then you have to find those little times to fit that in for yeah. sure. I completely agree with that. Yeah. And I'm getting more in tune with 
knowing when I need to play instead of work mm. because for a long time my ego told me that I didn't deserve to rest unless I had won an Oscar. Right. And until then I couldn't take a walk, I couldn't take a nap, I couldn't have a good <laughs> meal, I couldn't get my hair done, you know, and we we um I think we rob ourselves of of a, a happy, joyful life because we feel like we need to do something first to deserve it. And that's not true at all. Yeah. Not true at all. Do you think you have a pretty good, like, balance? can you listen to yourself when you need to go for a walk or take a day off or do you just kind of plow through? I'd say I'm getting better. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's like, hard, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's I, really I write, hard. It's for some reason, writing for me is literally like nine to 4 a.m. is like when I'm most productive writing. Oh my so goodness, no, it's tough. No. I can't do it all the time, obviously. But if I like am trying to finish something, yeah, that's you like, just got to push through sometimes. Yeah, deadlines but, do exist, but <laughs> yeah, or deadlines in my own head, right? right? Yeah, <laughs> self-imposed deadlines. Yeah, all good though. Yeah, you meant you mentioned joy. What what's brought you the most joy in life? This book. Yeah, finishing this book. Mm. Hell yeah! Honestly, uh. This was such a hard birthing process for me. I always thought that to be a writer, you had to go to some fancy school and have a degree. And I didn't have that, so I shied away from it for a long time. But it was something that was so important to me. And, and ah, God, I just had to, at a certain point, just say, you know what? Just It doesn't have to be perfect. Just get it out there. Just yeah. Fuck it. Sorry, can I cuss on your show? Yeah, whatever you want. Yeah. Like <laughs> when you're being called by something yeah. to pull it into existence, and you don't have to be an artist, anybody listening can relate to this. That voice is gonna tap you and it's gonna whisper to you. And then if you don't listen, it's gonna start poking you, and then it's gonna start hitting you and punching you, and then it's gonna knock you on your ass. Yeah. And that's really where I got with the book. I was like, trying to deny it for so long. It took me 14 years to finish. Wow. Um, but, but it's been the greatest joy of my life to bring it into existence. And it means so much to pass on um, because I truly believe that the message of it is, is uh, what people need for healing as a human. And I'm grateful to have contributed something that might help some somebody else. But aside from that, like things in life that bring me joy. Oh my gosh. I'm all about joy these days. If it doesn't bring me joy, get it out of my face. Honestly. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> like I think that I've arrived at having a love affair with myself because for so long, mm. like I said, until I, if I didn't book that acting job, I didn't deserve a bubble bath. I didn't deserve those, mm. those candles lit. I didn't deserve the perfume. I don't know if you're like this. Maybe this is more a woman thing. I'm sure you I'm sure you do this, Julia. Like my publicist is here. Hello. <laughs> Hello, gorgeous. Like for me as a woman, I I went through this phase in life where like, oh, I can't light my candle because I'm home alone tonight and I don't want to waste it on myself. Like I need to save mm. the candle for when I have a guest over. Or like, oh, I'm not gonna wear my perfume today because I'm home alone and no one's gonna smell me. Fuck that. Yeah. I want the perfume. I want the candle. It's for me. I come first. Right. You know? So yeah. that's where I'm at in my life. Just this love affair with myself. And I am married to a wonderful romantic man who makes my life very joyful. But before any of that, I come first with me. And I, I deprived myself of that for so many years, trying to chase, like booking a job until yeah. I was worthy. And if I stand for anything to tell people now, it's like you are worthy right now as you are. You don't have to fix anything. You don't have to achieve anything. Yeah. We're all worthy and lovable. Yeah. Amen to I, that. I love that, uh, that advice because the problem with people not believing they're worthy is then all of a sudden – all those things that are meant for you, you're going to just not let them in your life. Exactly. The relationships, the jobs, the the conversations, you know, like if you don't think you're worthy to be there, you know, and, and I've been in rooms that I'm like, <laughs> who, what, how, how did I get here? Yeah. And then it took someone saying, you're supposed to be here. Yeah. You know, and yeah. then I realized 
I got to the point where I'm like, no matter where life takes me in this path, I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. Exactly. And I just have to believe that. And you, know? you so deserve to be wherever you are because the world needs your light. Yeah. <laughs> you Likewise. know, that, that's yeah. how that's I feel I, with this. Yeah. Like the, I'm describing the book as like, oh, I'm so excited to share it with people. But it's not because I have any ego about it. It's because the world needs this story. The world yeah. needs your story. Each of us has a story inside of us that is valuable. Yeah. Very absolutely. valuable. And, yeah, and, and that's, that's why everyone in the world belongs in whatever room they're in. Yeah. And that's, that's like you said, it's bringing light into the world. It's your one, even if only one person read this book. Exactly. And, and it lit a spark in them to change the life of millions and millions of people. It's like, you don't know what your impact or your existence, your light, your, you know, mindset, whatever it is, your existence is going to impose on somebody else and it could change the world. Yeah. In, the, in what you may not see as a big thing, but that's right. you change the world of one person. Of one person, that's exactly that's, right. And if yeah. anybody ever forgets that or feels overwhelmed by not being able to make a difference, just take it back to my question. If it was you and you needed that loan, if it was you and you needed that song or that smile or that open door, would it change your life? Absolutely. That's the answer. Yeah, 100%. I love that. The I mean, we are coming up on Valentine's day, actually <gasps> in yes, February. And, you know, one of the letters that was written oh, home, God. um, you know, was a Valentine's day letter. Um, were you able, I know he had to burn a lot of your grandmother's yeah. letters. Um, there's some stories in there. Were you able to put together some of the pieces? Like there's a story about a mouse and her sister and Wanda's <laughs> sister, I think. <laughs> yeah. And like things like that, like, were you able to ask Wanda some of those things to fill in the blank on, on the stories. <laughs> it's funny you say that. The way that I filled in the blanks was my writing partner, Aditya Potwarden. He's a filmmaker and we've finished the screenplay for this film we're doing based wow. oh, on congrats. these letters. Thank you. Um, him and I, we tried to do that. We tried to fill in the blanks because we were so fascinated by what her answers might have been. So we we um we like went through each letter and wrote down what he said and the questions he asked her. Those were our yeah. clues. He'd be like, honey, you said you went to the dentist. Like, is your tooth yeah. still hurting? Or you said you'd been down to my mom's farm or whatever. Um, do you still have enough money? You know, did you go yeah. to the club again? I heard, whatever. Yeah. And we would write down all his answers chronologically and see how many, how much time had passed in between each one. And then we were able to like not get her writing back, which is heartbreaking that I'll never have that. But we were able to piece together a lot of what she might have said to him. As wow. far as her piecing together anything in our interview, no, um, she was not very helpful when it came to, <laughs> <laughs> to information like that. But I had to go really deep with her on some really big questions that I had about things I knew had happened in our family. Mm. Um, the book covers a lot of ground, man. It's it's hilarious because Wanda Mae Boyer was a hilarious character, but it's it, it's also um, pretty dark stuff that we all have in our families. Everything from mental illness and alcoholism to suicide to molestation, you know, to uh, the good stuff too. But I really tried to be as gentle as I could with her and focus on what I knew I needed answers for most. Right. At the same time, keeping her comfortable and not making her too upset. But it, mm. was, it was an interesting balance. I had to like keep her safe through the interview while getting what I wanted. Yeah, I mean, reading some of those Letters like guard duty on Christmas Eve oh my and God, can his, you believe it? I can't imagine, you know, and, and New Year's Eve and yeah. And you know what he did on Christmas. He talks and, about being freezing and how the clothes wouldn't dry because yeah. of the cold and these laundry women in Paris trying to do these, these guys clothes and little kids in the room and the clothing wouldn't dry. They were, they were the French people were so freezing the winters and just what he describes is an incredible look at life in the army in world war two. It's amazing. And, you know, I definitely got emotional at the parts where he's talking about how much he loves her. And, yeah. you know, if he had a rowboat, he'd go yeah. all the way home and see her. And, 
um it's it's just amazing these these letters are are incredible i could see why just immediately you were like you know we need to yeah. do something do with you this. have letters in your families because this is very common many of us have artifacts and family letters um honestly this inspired me to you know i'm next time i see my father i'm going to try to go back and do something or you know my parents it it, it worked it, it inspired me to go investigate and i am find so out. happy that is yeah. my success yeah. honestly if it never does anything else to hear you say that like i i made it that's it that was the point yeah. i'm so happy to hear you say that i, I can't it'll... wait to see what you find can you please check in <laughs> and tell me what you find because i guarantee you're going to be surprised Definitely. And I think it's going to have that effect on every single person that reads it. And I sure. also think that your parents will be blown away to have these conversations because nobody ever asks people as they're getting older about their life. Yeah. Like, I think it'll be, it's really healing. I think opening up those channels within our families and asking more questions and being more curious about each other will like cause a lot of miracles, I hope. Definitely. Definitely. Brock, do you have any letters or anything like that that you can think of? I don't know about letters. Um, I know there's, there, I'm sure there's something, but I think there's a lot of stories that yeah. haven't been told. Yeah. I mean, but, what you were telling me before we recorded was yeah. like a book in itself. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's a beauty of like, even, even my grandfather, right? Like I, I have, my knowledge of him is through my family, right? Right. On, on my mom's stories. side. Yeah. So I've got stories and that's he was right. such a great man who passed early. Wow. You know, he passed very early and um, my grandma, has never been remarried to this day, never dated anybody. Oh, She's waited. And I remember having this conversation with my, uh, my aunt and my mom. And they're like, I just wish, you know, she's in her 70s now. I just wish that she would find somebody, you know, and like just, some, just be happy and this. And I'm like, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm the kid, you know, yeah. at, at this time. And I'm sitting here like, I'm like, you guys don't get it. I was like, she found her soulmate. That like she's it. still in love with him to this mm -hmm. day. They're still going to be together after this, you know, like. I know that. And then, and, and I, that kind of love, I was like, that's the kind of love that I want. Yeah. And, and I sat there and I remember my aunt, uh, she was like, wow, I never thought about it that way. And I'm like, yeah, I, I get to see an example of love that's so pure and so true and so real through a couple that one's in a different place and the other one's here yeah, on but earth. Honoring you know? it for the rest of her life is yeah. what makes her happiest. My entire life. So it's been over 30 years that she's, wow. you know, been this way and you know she's just fully committed i think it's one of the, and so for me i've had this example of like what kind of man was he was right? he right and anybody that's ever talked about him, my family has talked so highly of him how hard he's worked Aww. um and i've carried that with me my whole life and to try and follow in that example of a man uh footsteps wow. you know and he's got this saying that i, I gotta do something with one day um but he used to say soar with eagles <sighs> um and it was. I can't believe you don't have that tattooed on you. Yeah, yet. well, I don't have tattoos yet. So, oh. <laughs> yeah. I have an eagle tattoo. Yeah. You do? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was in that, it was in the ethos of, uh, you know, the reason he said it was eagles fly higher than any other bird, right? Mm -hmm. And to keep company and, and to, to be the highest version of yourself, you know? Wow. And for me, it's just like, okay, how do I do that every day? How do I become that version? And, and uh, you know, in, in some ways, I've got a guardian angel that is there with that example, even if, if, if that's the only info I have. Well, yeah, I mean, you can have a, it's it's a beautiful relationship you have with him, even though yeah. he's in a different place. That doesn't mean relationships stop yeah. when somebody passes, you know? Yeah. My, my relationship with my grandmother has deepened since she mm -hmm. passed. She won't leave me alone, you know? <laughs> and they're always with us. Are yeah. you, are your grandparents living? Um, y yes, I have a grandfather on my father's side. And um, both on my mother's side, but wow. our, my mom's, or sorry, my father's mother uh, passed away mm. about 15 years ago. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's that connection and hearing these stories, it, it always brings joy and it tells you about yourself, it right? Does. Like knowing where you come from. That's right. And is, I think that that is an ache that we all share yeah. to understand ourselves through who and where we've come from. Definitely. Yeah. And like, you know, Brock, speaking of the love his grandparents had and reading about the love they had, that is the picturesque version of love we all want, right? Yeah. Like that is, you know, I've, I forget the line exactly. So forgive me for maybe misquoting, but That's it's, okay. you know, it's, 
we don't maybe we don't have everything but we have each other and that's the best for me right like just like our love is all i need right and like that just hit me hard (laughs) yeah i mean it's never going to be perfect and i guarantee your grandparents relationship rock was not perfect i'm sure they went head to head a lot um which we tend to forgive all that when somebody passes but yeah, it's not perfect. And that's the point. That is the title. Remember me as human. My grandmother said, you got to tell the truth because I was human and that's how I want to be remembered. I love that. You know how at like funerals, they're always like, oh, they were the most amazing person and they were <laughs> this and they were that. It's like, no, I don't want all that. Yeah. Just remember me as human. That's great. There's a lot of relief in that, don't you yeah. think? Like, oh God, I don't have to be some. Perfect perfect thing it's okay we're still lovable we're still worthy even if we're serial killers i hate to say that but on a on a very soul level you know for sure you're still worthy i take back what i no i don't take uh, that's <laughs> a whole nother conversation a one, yeah. that's yeah. a whole nother karmic level conversation that yeah. we're not here to have yeah. ask yeah. me more hollywood questions yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what are your favorite experiences in Hollywood? Oh my God, you're really going for it. Yeah. (laughs) What are my favorite experiences in Hollywood? Well, what is Hollywood? Let's say on a a movie set or on a TV show set or on an acting experience. Oh my gosh. Well, I had this great, okay, yeah, I had this great um, experience with Fiona Apple once in in a restroom at a club. I was at that club Largo and she was in the restroom with me and it's a tiny like two person restroom. You can't even move. You have to like scoot around each other. And I was wearing these uh, gold shoes that were Gwen Stefani. And she looked down and she said, I like your shoes. And I said, thanks. I like yours too. And she said, I stole them in seventh grade. Wow. And then she just walked and I said, Nice. <laughs> she just walked out. We've I never met, but we had this moment in the. In That's the amazing. Bathroom. That's so great. About her stolen shoes. Uh, um, a wow. human moment. Yeah, it was a very human moment. Yeah. It really was. Oh, God. I've had some surreal shit. I've had some <laughs> surreal stuff. I mean, yeah. I was talking the other day about like playing the Orange Bowl halftime show with Ashley Simpson. I was in her band at one point and it was like 70,000 people in this arena plus live on ABC. And we had like a thousand cheerleaders on the field with us. And the yeah, Orange Bowl is huge, huge. And Kelly Clarkson and Trace Adkins and us were playing and we get to the field and there's just static in our in-ears. There was no, we couldn't hear a click, music, nothing. No way. And the band was playing to a track and then her and I were singing live. And uh, everyone's running around. I guarantee everybody got fired that day. And, <laughs> and Kelly goes up and performs and not just static, just a, a train wreck. And then we were last and we get up there and couldn't hear anything except like a four second bounce back from the stadium so i just looked at her from like 20 feet away and tried to stay in time with our voices at least and when you watch it on youtube we're like four seconds behind the band and it just sounds so bad oh no and then when we got done the entire arena was booing the whole place erupted in boos they had been booing since kelly started but because we were last it looked like it was us you got the brunt of it and i just put my hands on my hips and just turned slowly around and i just thought take this in baby because this when would you ever experience something like this right it was so insane yeah just the craziness (laughs) of it all right Yeah, out of, out of your control that's like just... what being a seasoned performer means, I think, is like you, anything that could have gone wrong has gone wrong. So you know how to do your job now and deal with anything that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. You get a thicker skin, right? And Absolutely. A, a better understanding of self. And that is why the music business is a mess now, because people are getting signed from their TikToks going viral and they don't have that performance experience. So they don't know what they're doing on stage. And my father always told me, you must be able to deliver live. Mm. That mm. is the rule. Mm. And that doesn't exist in the music that I'm seeing. Yeah. I think it's in the toilet. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he would definitely know. Like, if you're, you know, coming in to the Eagles and bringing that live guitar, rock and roll, like you're, you're basically like stepping up 
the best band of all time, right? And yeah. you're improving it. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just come from another generation and yeah. so do I. I'm old fashioned in the respect I have for the craft and I see it being, yeah. you know, just bastardized constantly in today's Hollywood, as we, as you yeah. said, but. Yeah. Uh, There's an element of that in film and TV. Oh, know? I know. Yeah, for sure. Massive. It's uh, mediocrity abounds. Yeah. I mean. It's more and more of it. Yeah, yeah, it's really, movies. it's really disheartening. Yeah. It's really, it's really quite, quite depressing. Yeah. But what are you going to do? All you can do is make sure that your own stuff is quality, as quality as can be. And yeah. Yeah. Moving. And with music, like you said too, right? It's like normally you'd go, you know, maybe you start like doing dive bars or smaller clubs and then you kind of work your way up and then you like meet an agent. And then, like you said, by that time you've already performed hundreds right. of times yeah right and like with acting uh, they do this in england a lot where a lot of the kids will go into theater and do plays like their whole childhood and then yeah. they come up and you know like an anthony anthony hopkins or That's something right. like that um and not only but that yeah. but in drama school they have to perfect an american accent before they can graduate oh, I didn't which know that. fucks american actors because the brits <laughs> yeah. have the training and then they come yeah. over and knock us out of the water with their perfect accents That's and get all fun. the jobs yeah. cuz they actually still have respect for the craft yeah. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny my buddy, I'm not going to say who, uh, but he just lost a role like that to an English actor in, in like a Navy SEAL role. I'm like, I'm sorry, dude. I, I mean, I, yeah, well, the guy's good. What can <laughs> I like say? constant. <laughs> yeah. That's why little me, little LA actor has done as much theater as possible and as much Shakespeare under my belt as I can, because this is what we're yeah. competing with. I was just going to ask you about that. How do you like uh, a play or, or live performing in that sense versus on film? I love it because it scares the shit out of me and yeah. I love to like put myself through the ringer. That's why I like to sing the national anthem and things like that because I just like, it's like a, a cold plunge mm. Mm. and you got to do that for your system every once in a while, you know? Yeah. Like I figure if I can get through a two and a half hour Shakespeare play, I can do pretty much anything I put my mind to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's good to test your limits like that so you know where you're capable of going. And we're always capable of more than we think. Yeah, There's a great quote I saw recently, which I will also misquote, is like, when you've reached your limit, you're really only at about 40% of your capacity. Mm. And it's Ooh. so true. And that's why I love um, like stories about humans in these extraordinary circumstances, like climbing Mount Everest or yeah. like a shipwreck. Because, man, we have no idea what we're capable of. We're all like house cats when our souls are really pumas in the jungle. We just I don't know our true selves. We just don't yeah. know our true selves. And that's okay. That's what being human means. That's yeah. the limitation of being human. But to me, it's like about pushing those limits or like, I'm bored. Yeah. Right. It's, it's one thing to be the first person to do it. But then the thing that I've noticed over the years is I grew up skateboarding and surfing and a lot of extreme sports. Um, yeah, you're the same. You both are. I know you are. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have these like massive resumes of all these crazy things no. you've <laughs> you've pursued. And that's why. It's because your puma's in the jungle. That's right. We all are. We all are. We all are. Sorry I interrupted you. No, I mean, yeah, it's all good. You, I'm, we'll do it again anytime. <laughs> um, and, but it's, I, well, you see like Everest, for example. Yeah. Nobody had ever done it. Finally, right. one person does it and then thousands do it after. That's right. And then the boundaries of, I've seen it in extreme sports, you know, even in, you see it in, in normal sports too. There's Steph Curry's and, and yeah. you know, there's people out there that are just taking it to a whole nother bar. Diana Nyad, this film is out right now yeah. about her life, the swimmer. Yeah. That yeah. was extraordinary. And it's And that's the thing is like, we can, it's somebody believing in themselves enough to go do it. But then yeah. when, when someone else sees you do it, that's right. You're opening up the floodgates for everybody else. You to are. And it's no easier for them, the thousandth person than it was for you. But yeah. I think- being willing to test those limits and, and and go for it is a huge gift to the world because you're yeah. right. It does give other people hope and permission and freedom to do the same. And I would, I would bring that back to our emotional health. When you cry or when you are emotionally available, you are allowing others to, yeah. to do it as well. And that's a huge gift to, to pass on. And especially for big strapping men like you, like it's even more powerful coming from you 
because men have been so suppressed throughout history with yeah. their emotions. That's why the the rates of suicide in men are higher than women. Yeah. Because you have to deal with all these societal rules that say you're not allowed to cry. That's weakness. Yeah. When I got with my husband, his mother told him not to cry in front of me because it would scare me away. And pretty early on, we got in a fight and he cried. And he said, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be crying in front of you. This is what my mom said. And I said, that's one of my favorite things about you. Like, it's not weak. Please know that from a woman's mouth. We do not see that as weak. We see that as powerful mm. and exciting and safety and mm. yeah. all the good things. So I hope that men really like, yeah. please be beacons of hope for these men. Please be emotionally free with yourselves. And, yeah. and it's just such a, a loving, generous, generous thing to, to walk around with. Yeah. Well, Why did I say that? What were you talking about right before that? I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm so captivated <laughs> know, by what you it, just though. said that I actually forgot. Um, <laughs> I no, but it. I mean, that's, that has been yeah, like put, <clears throat> pushing boundaries and like yeah. having the courage to go for it. Yeah. But it's, yeah. And then it, that's physical stuff as well as emotional, emotional yeah, stuff that's, that's and psychological to, yeah, stuff is the emotional part of it. And that's exactly what you're saying for me is I've had these conversations with other male actor friends of mine. And, and the reason I wanted one, it's obviously like I, again, like since a young age fell in love with, film and, and yeah. I, I grew up with the tv and you know i tried all these different things that i just i've i've always been gravitating towards it my entire life and then finally i committed to go do it um but for me i look at it as like i'm i'm a big guy mm -hmm. physically i'm a large guy and you know i'm i'm masculine and you know i i know what i want and i know what i'm gonna go do to go get it and and there's this element of we grew up in the 90s and 80s and 70s and watching all of these action heroes that were just these big tough guys right None of them were talking really about their emotions, their oh, feelings, no. or anything. Exactly what you're saying with these high suicide rates. And, and I've dealt with that, you know, yeah. since an earlier, early age. And I got to the point where I was like, you know, I don't know where this life is going to take me. I don't know if my career is going to go where I want it to. I'm going to give everything I got and I'm going to try everything and I'm going to put myself out there. I'm never going to quit. And hopefully, you know, God willing, it takes me where I'm supposed to go. But at the end of the day, if I have this vessel, this shell, right, that embodies, let's say, a masculine guy. And then I'm also vulnerable. I take what these guys did in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, and then I add in a layer of it's okay to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. To what you're saying, it is actually a more, in my opinion, uh, a stronger trait in a male. It's, it's a, a more superpower. Mas exactly. It's more masculine than the, than the latter. That's right. And if you're able to do that, then it gives other men permission to do the same, and then we start to heal. Exactly. And that's where I'm like, I, again, I don't know where my career is going to go, but I feel, feel called. We we're talking about calling our callings, right? And that tapping, poking, punching. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, eventually, I'm going to get knocked out if I don't go do it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for me, it is that. Yeah. It's because I know what it's like. I grew up with a single mother and a bunch of sisters, and I grew up around these women all the time who were, those were the strong ones to me. Those are the ones that taught me everything I knew about being a man, funny enough. Um, and then also how to be vulnerable, how to communicate, how to, you know, not shove everything down. And it's scary to do that. I don't like talking about my feelings all no, the time. Of course you know? not. It's but, not comfortable for yeah, anyone. Exactly. But if you get to the point where you're so confident and living in your truth, that you show up and like, I'm okay if somebody knows a deep, dark secret about me, like you don't need to know everything, right? But the things we do talk about, if I'm vulnerable about that and then that gives you permission and you get to heal that part, like I've had conversations with so many men over the years that yeah. they're like, I've never told this to anybody and you, I can't even explain to you how much this has helped me. Right. And it's just those one, that one little conversation, that one little act of me being vulnerable, That's allowing right. them. And I'm okay with that. That's right. And I think vul people confuse vulnerability with telling someone your life story. Yeah. And that's not what it means. It means showing up and taking the risk of sharing something personal and not knowing how the other person's going to respond. Yeah. yeah. They could take what you just said and stomp on it and kill it <laughs> and make fun of you. That's the risk you take. Yeah. And I'm okay with that because I can stand confidently as a man. That's what vulnerability not is. Yeah. And I think it's so important what you're saying uh, for men to hear that from a woman's perspective of like, no, that is more powerful. That so, is, so they need to hear that's that. what we want in a yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> that's what women want. What about Start you? Do you boys. I mean, have anything to say on that? I had an experience. There's a, there's a uh, Lyft driver who kind of is in this area and he's driven us to a premiere. He's kind of, you know, 
who's driven us a few times. Great guy, yeah. super nice. And he drove me the other day. And basically at the very end of the ride, I mentioned the podcast and how we were kind of talking about, you know, kind of similar topic, men and feelings, all that. And it's okay. And he goes, yeah, you know, I, uh, I broke up with my girlfriend or she broke up with me and I've been depressed for a month. And I literally sat outside talking to him for like 20 minutes at the end of the ride. Yeah. And literally he goes, I'm gonna go check out the podcast and, and listen more. But honestly, like, thank you so freaking much. Wow. Um, and it's like, I never would have known that he, he was actually very nice and energetic and positive. And, but then one little question, and that's just a random day within a week, you know? Yeah. But I, I agree. It's like, he never would have said anything no. regardless, but, or not regardless, but if we didn't actually get into it. That's and right. yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting topic for sure. Um, I definitely think how, you know, what would, what would the letters be like if they didn't include his emotional state and what he was feeling, right? And expressing how much he loves Wanda and, and how much he misses her and how much he wants to get home. Because yeah. that literally, he admits that's what keeps him going yeah. and like able to fight in the war and able to keep going is the thought of their love. And if you're not emotionally available, then, then you're not going to write about it. Right. So that's right. Um, that's why yeah. so many men, when they were leaving for war, asked a woman, even if they weren't dating yet, can I write to you? Yeah. Because it's life saving. Yeah. It really is. I mean, the, the, you're right. There's no other point for him to have written letters except for emotion. Yeah. That's what keeps people going that human connection. That's what we all need. And I would pose, um, like a challenge to everyone, especially in this city of Hollywood, I challenge you to have a conversation and ask the other person questions. I cannot tell you how many conversations I have where the other person doesn't ask me a single question, and it is so confusing and disgusting. Mm. I don't understand that. We are trained because of technology and social media to talk at each other about ourselves. Yeah. And we think that that's a conversation. Don't come near me with it. Yeah. yeah. We are harming ourselves by doing that. And it's not okay. Yeah. I really have a problem with it. So I want to put that challenge mm -hmm. out there. Let's see if our conversations change, huh? Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I completely agree. I completely because agree. Because if you hadn't asked that guy, he never would have, you never would have unraveled that beautiful world that's inside of him and changed his life that day. Yeah. I just you have know, and that's just one little of, thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I know. I agree. In LA especially, I think we got to. We got to do that a little bit more. Absolutely. If we've lost the art of the handwritten letter completely, at least we can still be interested in each other. Is that too much to ask? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you doing, um, are you doing anything fun to like promote the book before it comes out or are you doing any more? She's doing things? it right now. I'm having wonderful about? conversations yeah. with lovely people like you. I'm having so much fun with you. I know we could talk all day, but, but yeah. But it's a month. It's like a couple months. So there is a lot more time before the book comes out. Brock. March 12th, <laughs> March 12th. We've got about five weeks. Uh, yeah. I don't even know what day. I don't even know what, when, what day of the week it is or anything, but yes, March 12th. Um, we have a lot going on. I'm having some, some wonderful, um, release parties, which I would love you to come to mm. if you're around. And, um, I will be, I can't spill the beans yet, but I'll be on some incredible television shows talking about all this and, and, um, very exciting what's happening. There's something yeah, there's a lot in the works. That's great. Um, it'll That's great. be coming out gradually, but just really reminding myself to celebrate this part of the process because it's it's been something that has taken me a lot of years of sitting in front of my computer, as you know, as writers, just spending that time in isolation. And now for it to be out and sitting here with us is um, a mm -hmm. miracle to me. And like, Things move so quickly and there will be more phases to it where it is reaching critical mass and touching a lot of people. But right now it's new and it's it's just happening. So I got to remind myself to slow down and enjoy that 
that season yeah. of the process because the beginning is of, of anything in life, the beginning is so magical and so special and it's gone before you know it. Yeah, you only get it once. You only get it once and it's, it's the most fleeting bit of the experience. Yeah. And so to really just memorize the way that feels and, and just take as much joy as I can from that, that's my month ahead. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I'm so grateful you're here and we're able to talk about I'm, it. And this dive was into so it. It surprising. Cool. I thought we would talk about sports and sports drinks <laughs> and, and BC and like, I don't know. You just, you're both such powerhouses of like entrepreneurship that I didn't know where our conversation would take us. But um, I'm glad that we went where we went. Yeah. And we couldn't have done it without you. We're grateful for you coming here and, and sharing your time with us, sharing Thank your stories. You. and. Um, making this, writing this book, putting so much of yourself into it and sharing what you are. Cause I know everything I've seen so far, the parts that I've read so far and, and your stories that you've shared, it's going to change and help a lot of people. And we're very grateful for that. Thank you. Can I mention one organization I'm working with regarding all this? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I just partnered with an, with an association called the National Association of Long-Term Care Volunteers. And what they do is they help bring um, volunteer companions into nursing homes to spend time with the elderly population. It's super easy to get involved. It's a national organization. So whatever your community is, wherever you live, I guarantee there's a nursing home at the end of your road and you can easily go through this training program that's online to be able to walk in there and volunteer an hour to sit with somebody, to wow. play cards, to sing music, to just ask them about their lives, whatever. Uh, it's super easy to get involved. So I would like to invite everybody. You can DM me. You can reach out for more information. You can follow me on socials, The Lucy Walsh. And uh, the book is available March 12th on Amazon. Amazing. That's incredible. And we'll put that link in the description to the organization and all that. And Wonderful. for the book and all that. Yeah. I hope to see your faces in the nursing homes. We'd love to. God, the little old ladies would have fun <laughs> no. with you oh. too. I, uh, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll see when we get there. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. I love it. I'm going to take you with me. I'll we'll make a documentary of it. Let's go. That'll be the yeah. next podcast. It'll be live from uh, the nursing home. You know, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for watching Studio 22. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And follow our socials at Studio 22 Podcast.